Hydrocylatrine is a relatively new reagent, found to be very useful in the synthesis of secondary and tertiary amines, from aldehydes and ketones, via reductive amination. Reductive aminations are commonly used in chemistry to achieve this type of conversion, but often use the reagent sodium cyanoborohydride, which is toxic and can release hydrogen cyanide during the workup. Besides, it is kind of expensive. Another safer option is the reagent STAB, but it isn't compatible with some aromatic ketones and it means. Now, hydrocylatrine is not the cheapest either, yet at least, but it is air stable, non toxic, and easily substitutes these reagents in reductive amination. Since I needed to do a reductive amination in a future video where the procedure calls for sodium cyanoborohydride, I thought, let's make hydrocylatrine and test it in the next video where I need to do the reaction and see if it works. Since I don't have any of the reagents needed to make hydrocylatrine, I will first make all of them myself since that's a lot cheaper. So first, I will make the precursor boratrain. So to get started, I set up a flask in a glycerol heating bath and add in 250 ml of toluene as a solvent. I then add in 30.9 grams of boric acid as the first reagent, which can be found easily as ant killer. And then 66 ml of triethanolamine as the second reagent. I add a tiny bit of water to help the reagents mix, since their solubility in toluene is bad. I also wash out the cylinder with some water, since triethanolamine is very viscous. I then attach a Dean Stark apparatus with a condenser on top. When the mixture in the flask is boiling, it will azeotropically distill over a mixture of toluene and water that collects in the reservoir, which is the water that I added plus the water that is produced in the reaction. The water sinks to the bottom of the reservoir and the toluene stays on top. The toluene can then overflow back into the flask while the water keeps collecting in the reservoir. This way, we can constantly remove water from the reaction mixture and drive the reaction forward. I fill the reservoir with toluene so that it can start overflowing right away, though it is not mandatory, unless you really need to keep the amount of toluene in your flask constant. I then just continue heating until it starts to boil, and I also insulated the bridge with some aluminum foil to make it go faster. The toluene water azeotrope starts distilling over, and we can see the water droplets sink to the bottom. I then just let this mixture boil until no more water separates, indicating that the reaction is finished. And I also occasionally empty the reservoir when it is completely filled with water. In this simple reaction, triethanolamine reacts with boric acid to form boratrain and three molecules of water. When the reaction is finished, a chunk of solid is stuck to the bottom, which should be mostly boratrain. I decant off all the liquid and discard that. At first, I tried to redissolve it into some boiling acetone to recrystallize it, but the solubility in acetone was really bad. So I poured that out and then did the same, but with ethanol, which was a lot better. After a while of boiling, it had all dissolved. And I then poured into this beaker, which has the solid that crystallized out of the acetone at room temperature. I then set this beaker in the freezer at minus 25 C to crystallize out the bore train. When that's done, we see some stuff has crystallized out and the yellow impurity stays dissolved. I had also put the acetone in the freezer, out of which a tiny bit more solid crystallized. Now I decant off the liquid from both of them and discard it. I then filter out all of the solid from the beaker and the flask and I wash it with ethanol and then with acetone. I let it dry on the filter for a while and I move all of the collected solid to this crystallizing dish, but it is still a bit wet from the solvent. So I set it in the oven to evaporate it all off. When that's done, I am left with 58.5 grams of a white solid that is boratrain, which is a yield of 74%, which is pretty much the same as most of the other literature. So that was pretty simple. Now that that's finished, I will start making the catalyst, which is aluminum ethoxide. So I set up a large three-neck flask in a heating mantle and add in 100 ml of xylenes as a high boiling point inert solvent. Into that, I add in 25 grams of aluminum powder as a reactant. Since aluminum is covered in a very unreactive layer of aluminum oxide, we have to strip away this layer and expose fresh aluminum that can be reacted with. To do that, we can use amalgamation. So I add a pinch of mercury 2 chloride and then one little ball of iodine. Iodine will help destroy some of the aluminum oxide coating, exposing fresh aluminum. Mercury 2 chloride then reacts with aluminum to form mercury metal and aluminum chloride. This mercury then alloys with the aluminum, forming an amalgam. From this amalgam, we can continuously react away the aluminum while the mercury stays behind and amalgamates with more aluminum until only oxides and mercury are left. So I have attached a condenser, bring this mixture to a reflux and then fill the dropping funnel with 170 ml of ethanol. I then gradually drip in the ethanol, which produces a lot of heat when it reacts with the aluminum, causing the mixture to boil vigorously. It's important to do it slowly, otherwise it will produce so much heat that all of the solvent will just boil off. 
In this second simple reaction, aluminum reacts with ethanol, forming aluminum methoxide and hydrogen. Normally, we wouldn't think of aluminum metal as being too reactive, but that is only because of its oxide coating. If pure aluminum is exposed, it reacts very easily and generates a lot of heat. When all of the ethanol has been added, it is a dark bubbling slurry containing solid, insoluble aluminum ethoxide. I take it off heat and allow it to cool down to room temperature, and then set it up for vacuum filtration to collect all the formed solid. I wash it down with some xylene and a grey solid that's left behind. It does react with water in the air, but it isn't too problematic, since it will just form a coating. I move all of the solid to a large flask and heat it strongly under a vacuum to distill off remaining solvent. After that, the solid begins to melt, and trapped solvent quickly distills off. Then, when I increase the heat and pull a stronger vacuum, aluminum ethoxide starts to distill and solidify as a white solid. Since I can't really get it through this short path properly, I change it for this setup to see if I can distill it over. Though when I pull the vacuum again, it all started to boil vigorously and a bunch of it shut up through the setup. So that makes this setup and the receiving flask already contaminated. It is also really annoying to melt down and run through the setup. And it would be a huge pain to clean this out and redo it. Since I only need a tiny amount of aluminum ethoxide, I just take whatever is in the receiving flask and use it as is, because I doubt contamination of aluminum and oxides are relevant for the reaction. So I am left with some aluminum ethoxide as a grey white solid, and also set that aside while I prepare the final reagent, which is triethoxysilane. So for that, I set up a large flask in an ice bath and add in 500 mL of toluene as a solvent. I then add in 150 mL of trichlorosilane as the first reactant with a syringe. I then attach a dropping funnel and add in 270 mL of ethanol as a second reagent. I then gradually drip the ethanol into the flask and they react pretty much immediately. I just let it all drip in and then let it stir for two more hours. In this reaction, trichlorosilane reacts with ethanol, replacing all the chlorines with ethoxide groups, giving triethoxysilane and hydrogen chloride that mostly bubbles out of solution. There's also a second unwanted reaction taking place here, where the produced triethoxysilane reacts with hydrogen chloride, forming chlorotriethoxysilane. This can then react with another molecule of ethanol, forming tetraethoxysilane as the major side product. Even if we add only three equivalents of ethanol, this reaction still occurs and leaves behind unreacted or less substituted starting material. When everything has been added and it had been stirring for a while, it became a yellow solution. I then take it out of the ice bath and set it up for short path distillation to first remove all of the toluene and unreacted starting materials. When all of that was gone, I attach a new flask and pull the vacuum to just distill over almost everything that was remaining, which is a mixture of triethoxysilane and tetraethoxysilane. I then take the receiving flask and redistill it to separate these components without vacuum. I assist it with a heat gun, and first, some crap comes over that I discard. Then, it starts distilling triethoxysilane with a boiling point of 135C. When tetraethoxysilane started coming over, easily spotted by the diffraction pattern in the distillate, I stopped the distillation and was left with 54 grams of what is mostly triethoxysilane. That is a sad yield of only 20%, but I guess I'll just have to live with that. And I immediately use this for the final reaction, now that I've made the three compounds that are required. So for the final reaction, I set up a three neck flask with a nitrogen line in a heating mantle. I keep blowing nitrogen through the setup and I attach a condenser in the middle and a funnel on the right. I first add in 34.3 grams of the Bora train I made earlier. Then as a solvent, 750 mL of xylenes. Now all of the triethoxysilane I just made. And finally as the catalyst, 0.66 grams of not the best purity aluminum ethoxide. For that reason, I'll just add double the amount that is called for. I then start with the right neck and flush out the whole apparatus with the flow of nitrogen. And I attach a balloon on top of the condenser to keep it all under nitrogen. I then bring this mixture to a reflux and leave it for 4 hours. In this reaction, the boron from borotrain and the silane from triethoxysilane are swapped, giving hydrosilatrain and triethyl borate. How exactly it proceeds, who knows, because this involves inorganic chemistry, and I'm not qualified to speak on that. When I return, a bunch of solid has settled on the walls of the flask, and I take it off heat to allow it to cool down to room temperature. After that, all of the products should have crystallized out, so I remove all the adapters, and filter everything through a glass fit to collect the solid. I 
and then move it all to this dish and dissolve almost all of it into dichloromethane to clean it up. I then filter this through some cotton, into a flask, leaving behind insoluble material. Now I distill off all of the solvent, leaving behind a white solid, though it still contains some solvent, so I will set it in the oven overnight. After that, it is a dry white powder, and I move it all to a crystallizing dish. In the end, I am left with 28.4 grams of 1 hydrosilatrain, which is a yield of 74%, and the same as the literature I am following. So even with the self-made reagents, the procedure works well. In a future video, I will try this reagent as a substitute for sodium cyanoborohydride to do a reductive amination. See you then.